Uh, does everyone know my boyfriend, Bob Vance? Kevin Malone. Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. And do you fellas take Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration to be your lawfully wedded husband? Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. What line of work you in, Bob? Hey guys, I'm Randy Younger, and this is a very special edition. Uh, it's an actual collaboration between Unger the Radar and Nostalgia Time with the Campaign. And tonight we are going to celebrate all things Office, it's, uh, 15 years of the great NBC sitcom The Office. And right now I have with me my, this is the first, we have a bunch, we have, th I have three co-hosts today. <laughs> so this is very different and very awesome. Uh, ladies first, we've got Rachel Kolb, hello. Hi, uh, no. Office super fan here. I am so very excited to be talking about this show. Thank Great. You, Rachel. <laughs> and we've got Chris coming to hello. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Pleasure to meet you, Rob. Likewise. <laughs> also, uh, we've got Matthew Haberman, aka Kid Champagne. Welcome. <laughs> hello there. Welcome. I'm Kid Champagne, Matthew Haberman. Yeah. <laughs> are you real champagne or are you just sparkling wine? <laughs> <laughs> He's not French. Well, He's not. in the United States. There you go. <laughs> and of course, um, our wonderful guest of honor today, we've got Mr. Robert R. Schaefer, psycho cop himself. Also, Bob Vance, man, refrigeration. Hey, Robert, how are you tonight? Terrific. Uh, pleasure to be here with you guys. This is great. And ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so 15 years ago, The Office uh, aired on NBC. And ever since then, it's, you know, amassed a cult following. It's just, it's a hilarious show. It's a great mix of um, expert writing and expert acting, yourself included. And I just want to know, how does it feel being a part of that phenomenon? Well, it's, it's unrivaled in television history. I don't think there's ever been a show that's actually gotten bigger when it went off the air than The Office has. <laughs> I mean, we currently dominate net, Netflix with seven and a half percent of their audience just belonging to Netflix to rent the office. Of course, there was a billion dollar war over the rights to it, which uh, the NBC uh, brand has uh, reacquired, uh, I believe starting next year. Um, lucky, I mean, uh, when I went on the show, it was the, you know, the, the first season, it was the lowest rated show in NBC history with the 2.1 Nielsen chair. Hmm. Uh, they had aired the first six episodes. I came in season two, episode 10. And that's when we got picked up for the rest of the year. After that, we won the Emmy, and then, you know, all, all bets were off. I mean, we really hit our stride in seasons three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. oh. Robert, I think you're muted. Um, there you go. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, it's really... Um, I don't know, it's been an incredible privilege, uh, really. And really, I tell people all the time, it's the best thing ever because as an actor, people always say to me, oh, wait, I know you, you know, uh, and you go, now I can just go, The Office. <laughs> so I don't have to explain it anymore. Oh, I've done 50 movies, I've done 40 TV shows, I've done 30 commercials, you know. You don't have to explain it anymore. <laughs> the Office. It's, it's just a part of your DNA at this point. <laughs> well, I, I see what you're saying, Rob. You're saying that when you came aboard, you were the cause for the success. Uh, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think so, but, you know, I had a very small part in it, and sure. I was lucky to be part of it. And, you know, I always just feel, felt like I did the most with the least. And so, um, you know, it was really simple. All I ever did was love Phillips, right? I mean, that's how complicated it was for me. Every scene that I'm in is about her. There's nothing ever about Bob. It's always about Phyllis, you know. So that's that's all I was playing. So. Except the meeting of the of the five families. Yes. Now, Bob, 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 you know, has his own life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, for me, the key element to the character was uh, he was the United States Marine Corps combat infantry officer in Vietnam. Hmm. So that was always what I was playing. You know, was that guy. And uh, mm -hmm. I know that guy, and I admire that guy, and uh, you know, so that was easy. And and working with Phyllis was easy, of course. And the rest of the cast was was so ridiculously talented. I mean, it's crazy how much talent we had there. 
And like you said at the open, uh, it's a perfect uh, storm of writing and acting coming together. That happens very rarely in television, but when it does, it's memorable. Definitely. Uh, Robert, if I could jump in for a second. Uh, you and Phyllis are just really wonderful together on screen. I always really enjoyed when they brought the two of you into the storyline and made you like either a major subplot or uh, in, uh, like had like a B story involving you. Like the, for example, the Valentine's Day episode where you go on the double date with Jim and Pam uh, to the restaurant, I always think is just the funniest episode. Um, well, it, 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 I always tell people that's one of the funniest moments for Phyllis and I was because we were in the bathroom in the dark, just me and her and a sound guy, and they kept going make, <laughs> making noises, right? So we're making love making noises for like a minute and a half at a time. And I go, you realize they're only going to use like two seconds of this. They're all just standing out there laughing at us right now <laughs> because it's fun, you know? So we, we had some fun with it, but yeah, that's a great bit. In fact, that was one of the only improv lines I ever snuck in was when I came back to the table and I said, would you like a big piece of meat? And, um, you know, that meant to stay here. That was, that was actually my follow-up question um, as far as how much of it, how much of the development of that uh, couple and that relationship and that character was you and how much came from the writers, um, maybe that there was some collaboration there? No, they take credit for it now, but it was me and Phyllis. I mean, uh, in Casino Night, my second episode, I said to her, you know, let's make this first love. If you remember your first love, you had eyes for no one else. Nothing else mattered. Nothing ever came between the, the two of you. And so if you play that, uh, that's what we were after. And so the writers had nothing to do with that, even though they like to say, oh, yeah, we knew all along they were going to be, you know, See, the, the element is, is that Bob and Phyllis had what everyone else on the show was trying to find, true love, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody else on the show was looking for that, and we had it. So, uh, you know, I can't take all the credit, but most of it. <laughs> now, Robert, for my question, how is it like working with Steve Carell? And what was the uh, favorite episode that you worked best with him? Well, Phyllis's wedding, obviously, because we had more interaction. Uh, he, uh, he's a great guy to work with. I mean, here's the thing. Uh, a guy that's carrying a show like he was carrying the show uh, with, you know, the emphasis of being funny. When you add the pressure of being funny, that means that you constantly are, you know, there's not really downtime for Steve. Steve is always getting the next scene ready. You know, he's always in his pages working. So, you know, our interaction He's not really a set bunny, you know, he's, he's not there to be everybody's pal. I mean, he was, he's a very friendly down to earth guy, but uh, I enjoyed him. I, you know, he's a pro's pro. I mean, and obviously very funny. That's great. And um, what, um, what is your favorite episode overall in the whole series? Well, uh, it, it would be, um, Phyllis's Wedding is one for me, uh, Dinner Party is two, and I'll say Casino Night is three. Not Scott's Tots, huh? <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that's uh, cringeworthy, as they say. Yeah. Um, Dinner Party, um, you know, is a classic. I was reading about it again today, actually. Uh, the uh, writer, uh, Andy Green, who just did the, the uh, book on The Office, um, they wrote an article in Rolling Stone about Dinner Party. And, you know, that was based on the Edward Albee play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Mm. Uh, if you've ever seen that film with Richard Burton and uh, Elizabeth Taylor, <laughs> they make Michael and Jan look like lovebirds, really. <laughs> um, so that was kind of the theme of it. And uh, I love that episode. I mean, uh, and Casino Night, I think, is just perfect, uh, you know, because it's got the the jam kiss and you know all the all the stuff going on and phyllis of course has all the clovers and so she beats the world series of poker champ <laughs> um robert so tell me about the beginning of it all uh how did you get the part and what was that audition process like well i as you said i auditioned for it the, the funny story about it is though it was the day i auditioned it was halloween and i'm just not a halloween guy i didn't even know it was halloween and so I was driving into Hollywood. I was going to Allison Jones, who was the casting director and uh, the premier comedy casting director in L.A. And so I was excited to be going in 
to meet her. And there was all this traffic. I'm like, normally a 15 minute drive for me has turned into a half an hour. Now I'm late. Mm. I'm the last guy of the day. I'm pouring sweat because I had to run. There was no parking. Mm. I, I realized it's Halloween when I see all the people in Hollywood with the costumes on. So uh, <laughs> I do the thing. I come out and there's these three girls standing out there. They're dressed as angels. And so they started anointing me with their wands. And I'm like, ah, maybe that's an omen. So two weeks later, I got the call back and uh, went out to the sound stages where we shot the uh, series. And Phyllis was there. And uh, I did a bunch of improv for them. Uh, you know, react to Michael. I mean, <laughs> you know, you really have no idea what you're doing there. So anyway, you just fake it. And I think Phyllis made the decision, you know, there were there were some good for, for the role. Uh, it was originally going to be one of the producers, uh, which I'm not really the biggest fan of writer, producers, actors. You know, I like things separate. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's interesting when you're working with the writer. And, of course, I've written a bunch of stuff, so I know what it's like to work with the writer. <laughs> You know, you want people to do your words the way the way you wrote them, not the way they interpret them. Mm. That's that's interesting. And I guess part of the evolution of of Bob is that he wasn't such a romantic at first, right? Wasn't he sort of supposed to be a, a jerk of of amongst other people like Michael Scott? And you evolved that into more of the romance between you and Philip. Well, uh, the. The only uh, line that they really uh, had in the first uh, in, in Christmas party was there was a line, uh, Bob says, hey, man, that's fantastic. And then they realized, no, that's a Michael Scott line. You know, uh, really what I was just trying to do uh, was change the energy. Uh, you know, when Bob enters his, you know, famous moment now, um, actually uh, was listed as number five on the top 10 office moment recently. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to hit him with big energy because it was the, the droll threesome, you know, Ryan and Stanley and, and Brian standing there. I mean, those guys, I mean, if you can crack those guys up, you're in business. And of course I broke Ryan on the first take. So, uh, you know, that lives in infamy. Um, is, is Bob fans based on a real person? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> No, not not as far as I know. No, uh, that was basically your own creation. Yeah, of course. I oh, mean, I mean that's again the, the writers have that input. You know, for instance, I never drank in any of the shows, and then suddenly in a throwaway line, Bob got drunk in Africa, ran over a, a an animal or a kid, nobody knows, and then it was hit and run, and <laughs> you know I'm not played all that stuff I, I just you know I just have to adapt to uh, what what the writers throw at me right well, now, have, have um, the writers ever thought about doing a spin-off episode of Van's refrigeration in the office well that would have been the obvious thing to do uh, would be Van's refrigeration you already have the First of all, the brand is bigger than almost Dunder Mifflin. I mean, if you Google Vance Refrigeration, I have a shower curtain that says Vance Refrigeration, okay? You fans send me socks, there's baby clothes, <laughs> every possible uh, thing uh, that you can buy. And uh, so the brand is established. I mean, if it had been up to me, <laughs> it would have been Vance Refrigeration. I would have hired a bunch of people from the office to come work for me. That way we could have retained some of those characters. And, you know, you would have been off and running. But uh, I've heard rumors, you know, they, they'd like to bring it back. I, I don't see how it's possible. But, you know, there's, there's rumors. Well, I was going to jump in here, actually, with um, as far as some of the characterization of Bob. There's actually an online rumor. Well, there's a fan theory which it's interesting that Office of All the Shows has spurred just a whole numerous like fan theories from who's the Scranton Strangler. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of speculation about Bob Vance and as far as his place in the community. Um, right. Particularly from there's a uh, mini-sode involving the accountants, a storyline involving the accountants. Mm -hmm. Uh, where Phyllis, met, uh, there's a throwaway line about uh, Bob's 
uh, grand jury indictment. Right, right. Um, do you have any thoughts about whether Bob Vance was a local crime boss and whether Vance Refrigeration was the real business he was in? It's a real business, <laughs> selling refrigerators and also fixing heating and air conditioning. No, I, I again, United States Marine Corps combat infantry officer. That's what, that's what I'm, I'm sticking with that. All the rest of it, listen, uh, the fans, are, they're crazy. They're, they, they speculate wildly on these things. I, you know, I got roped into a couple of these groups and then I had to leave because I just couldn't stand to read their, their stuff. They're terrible writers. <laughs> if, 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 they could write, if they could even punctuate, I'd be in it, you know, but they, they can't even punctuate. So, uh, I don't know. I, I, my, my, uh, the writer in me rebels at that kind of stuff. I think, I think I can understand, I guess, from a fan standpoint, the desire to want to add to that world, though, because I think The Office was really one of the first shows to have sort of that online presence and that back and forth with the fandom. Like, they had well, the, the web that's episodes. A, that's what saved the show, was uh, the, the cast interacting on MySpace, believe it or not, this or free Facebook, and about 10 of us on there interacting with the fans. Uh, of course, Steve had the big hit with 40-Year-Old Virgin. That was really what what uh, gave, got the green light for the uh, second season. Had that not happened, they probably would have canceled it. And oh, wow. we wouldn't even be having this conversation. <laughs> although, although we could talk about Psycho Cop, I guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and to that point, with with so much fandom, even after the series has gone off the air, and with Netflix and new generations of fans that are developing, what what, in your own words, would be the contributing factor to the show's timeliness that carries across generations? Well, it, it's not politically correct. That is the key yeah. element to comedy. It cannot be politically correct. Otherwise, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not funny. So I think everybody has to be a target. Uh, you know, uh, comedy uh, should not respect any uh, race, color, you know, religion, anything. That's what good comedy does. Uh, you know, ask yourself, would uh, Richard Pryor be working the big rooms today? Right. Maybe, maybe not. Right. Yeah, um, not holding back. You give it your all, right? <laughs> listen, uh, it, 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 you searching for funny. <laughs> you know, you can't be uh, hand tied behind your back. Right. Right. Uh, Robert, do you keep in touch with anyone from the cast, Phyllis, or anybody else? I do. Every now and then, we text. You know, uh, when I was, I just uh, moved out of LA a few uh, months ago, so. I would see them at the grocery store and, you know, at the driving uh, the golf course and things like that. Uh, but, I mean, that's kind of, you know, um, like your friendships from junior high school and senior high school, you know, you're, they fall by the wayside. The same thing happens in the acting world. I mean, you, you think you're going to be fast friends with somebody and you end up, you know, maybe having one friend from one movie and one friend from this show. And, you know, so it's not, you know, uh, like we're all spending time at each other's house all yeah. the time, you know. I mean, Angela and uh, 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 Pam, uh, <laughs> they're they're close. Uh, they they do a podcast, I guess. So uh, I know they they were always fast uh, fast friends. And so, you know, it's it's good. We're we'll all be friends when we see each other at the reunion. Nice. Maybe at the twentieth. <laughs> Yeah, it could be. <laughs> Any questions, guys? Yeah, no. So, so where, what would Bob Vance be doing today if we, <laughs> if we, uh, you know, sent a camera over to his place right now? <laughs> Selling refrigerators. There you go. <laughs> in fact, I, let me interest you in that new Sub Zero. Yeah. <laughs> Top of the line. Twenty-four thousand dollar one. Let's let's get let's, let's that one. That can run your house. Right. One where you can watch the office right on the, the door. Right? Yeah, no, they, they have the built-in screens now. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, 
Robert, were well, there I, any? Oh, sorry, Matt. I have a question. Um, did you have any other influence in the in the book that was written by Andy Green, the The Office, The Untold Story? What about it? Did you have any other influence in? Um, I know you said for the article, but did you have any influence with the book? Were you involved? Oh, I, he, he interviewed me for the book. I mean, there, there's there's some stories in there that I told him, you know. Uh, but he he you know he had pretty much everybody in there, so uh, it was pretty. Uh, Pretty awesome piece of uh, collecting uh, data mm -hmm. uh, and arranging it. You know, that's the key thing is arranging, uh, arranging the stories, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you had, if you were present for the Dundee Awards, what award did you think that you would receive from the Dundees? Uh, let's see. This one says uh, <laughs> biggest brass balls. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, they're clangers. And Robert, uh, speaking of props, were there any other uh, cool props that you got to keep from the show? Well, the sign. I have the sign, and I also have my parking lot sign. Okay. Um, I didn't really get much uh, any of the wardrobe. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I counted. I have uh, 40 dance refrigeration T-shirts <laughs> in my <laughs> closet there. Nice. So I've, I've been collecting them, that's for sure. <laughs> Stocking stuffers? <laughs> well, everybody thinks I get this stuff for free. I have to buy it. I mean, it's not free. <laughs> <laughs> Just because it says my character's name or it doesn't mean it's free. Gotcha. Um, so I actually, last night, I spent a, a good portion of my evening watching uh, Dick Dixter and the yes, Psycho Cop 1 and 2. It was... Uh, wow. Quite wow. an yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's that's a that's a trifecta for sure. Yeah, yeah. it was it was a fun night. Um, what was it like working on on Dick Dixter? Well, it's my baby. I wrote it, I produced it, I edited it, I, I cast it, I did it all. I chose the music, I chose the backgrounds. I mean, I, I it's a labor of love. <laughs> I was I wanted to make a mockumentary uh, after being on the office for uh, nine years, and so. I had this idea in my head about a director. I was always in love with Peter O'Toole and the stuntman. And then I worked with David O. Russell. We did a Kentucky Fried Chicken commercial together, believe it or not. And um, so that guy who's, an, you know, the auteur, the screamer, you know, that was kind of the starting point for me. And then uh, it evolved into the uh, drunken mess that Dick is. <laughs> yeah. Quite a performance. My cousin, Chris Ray, directed it. I Hi. I can't direct myself when I'm when I'm playing a part that is that uh, consuming. Uh, there's no way that I could. Uh, I'm objective enough. You know, I need somebody to watch. Uh, watch me. <laughs> <laughs> is there any particular uh, role uh, behind the camera or in front of the camera that you prefer over the other? Whether it's acting or writing or producing. Well, I like I like. Uh, I, obviously, acting is my first love, but writing is is close second because it's you know a beautifully a solitary thing to do. But in terms of film, I believe editing is the most important uh, part. I mean, when I cut Dixter, the first the director uh, gave me the first assembly was two hours and eleven minutes. Well, you can't deliver a comedy that's two hours and eleven minutes, so I had to cut it to eighty seven minutes, and that was tough because there was some really funny stuff. And I loved all the characters. I loved all the actors. You know, that's the one thing about your own movie. Uh, a friend of mine is Nick Vallelonga, who uh, won two Academy Awards last year for Green Book. And we had made a bunch of movies together. And he always suffered from the same thing, where your edit just is not, you know, it's too long. <laughs> The, the distributor is always going to say, uh, no, we don't need three hours here. We need it to be two hours, you know, so it's tough to cut stuff when, you, when you're in love with it. And you work with Nick on um, Cycle Cop 2, if, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I, I got him that role in that film. I made a stand. The director, Adam Rifkin, didn't want him. And I said, well, if he's not doing it, I'm not doing it. So I really had him over a barrel because I was the star of the film. <laughs> So I was just exercising a little star power there, you know. It's good. Every now and then you get to do it. 
Uh, will we ever see a cycle of cup three? The script is written. I wrote the script. Um, yes, you will. Perfect. We're going to make, make a really scary, uh, really scary film. I mean, I, I've uh, upped the ante. I've brought Joe Vickers into the 21st century. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Can't wait for that. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the book of revelations is in the script as well. So, you know, that's spooky stuff. I'll tell you, um, Psycho Cop 2, I watched that when I was a kid. It sure. borderline scarred me, but in a good way. Like, it was a good, you know, it was a good experience. Uh, and we well, the, well, when you're a kid, and those, you know, those beautiful women are running around. It's that's not true. <laughs> but, um, no, it was just, I think Psycho Cop 2 is probably one of my favorite horror movies of all time, so. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. congrats. That, that phenomenal performance, and I cannot wait to see part three. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. It's going to be different. Uh, you know, Joe's on the iPhone with Satan in this one. So, <laughs> nice. when do you hope to start production? Well, uh, I, you know, Adam Rifkin's involved and Nick Vallelong is involved as well. So, um, it's just a question of where we're going to finance it. Um, let me ask you: Are there are there particular roles um, that you would that you long to be in, or are there subject matters that you would uh, that you would love to be uh, be associated with uh, in, in new films? Well, I like westerns. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Sure. Yeah. West Virginia. Yeah. I was uh, actually we were uh, trying to sell a pilot a couple of years ago called Almost the Duke, where I played a guy who thought he was John Wayne. <laughs> so let me just tell you this. Um, no, I like, I, I wouldn't mind doing a Western, you know, I, I, it, I've done every genre possible. So uh, really the a actor's role is always the same. I mean, you know, just trying to find the, the truth of the scene and the character. So uh, the genre doesn't really matter to me. Uh, sure. You know, I like the part I'm interested in part, you know, is the part fully uh, fleshed out? Is it fully realized? You know, obviously, you know, if you can get the movie star roles, <laughs> those are the best ones because the camera coverage is better, right? You, you get <laughs> sure, sure. And the editor always chooses your take. So, <laughs> you know, problem solved. Sure. Sure, yeah. But um, it seems like you also have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of passion with writing too, and you can, you can create your own Westerns, right? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I have one, it's uh in pre-production right now, uh, and I'm playing the villain in it. It's called Bloodbound. Uh, uh, Tim Russ, uh, my manager, and Dick Dixter is directing it. So uh, that'll be fun. Uh, I'm looking forward to being the villain again. You know, as, as somebody once said, uh, it's very rare that uh, a horror villain becomes a, a you know, a, on a, a network sitcom. I mean, how many guys have done it? <laughs> I think you're talking to them. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Robert, are there any directors that you haven't worked with uh, that you'd want to in the future? Well, there's a bunch. I mean, I, listen, I love good directors. I mean, there, it's an incredibly difficult job. Uh, I always tell the story. Uh, I was doing a play, and it was the night before we opened. Mm -hmm. And I have a scene at my father's grave, right? And I'm saying, oh, man, you were this, you were that, you were a son of a gun. And the director stops me and he says, uh, Bobby, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean, what, I'm, what am I doing? I'm talking to my father. And he said, well, he's not in the ground. He's up in the heavens. Hmm. So instead of looking at the gravesite, I suddenly started looking up to the heaven. And that completely changed the scene. Hmm. Because now, you know, all the emotion just sort of freed up it was and that's what a good director does it's those little tiny moments you know i'm not a guy that needs a director i like i make all my own choices before i go in and if they don't like them they tell me and if they do then we just do it you know uh i'm not a needy actor i, I like to make all the decisions for myself mm -hmm. that's good Right. I mean, there's plenty of needy actors. You'd be surprised. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I bet. You'd be surprised how many big-name actors are constantly needing to be reassured. You know, how was it? Was it okay? Would you like me to change this? And so finally, one day, there was this guy who kept annoying the director. Every time after every take, he would go up to him and go, what do you think? What do you think about this? And finally, I said, hey, come here. <laughs> 
if he wants to talk to you, he's going to talk to you. He'll come over and tell you to change it. Otherwise, you're doing fine. Leave him alone. It's true. Got to be confident in that line of work. Well, that's that's key. That is key uh, to the to the gig, for sure. Nice. I, I, I read uh, or heard an interview with Brian Cranston, and he was directing something. They asked him what what is it that he looks for, and he said uh, confidence. <laughs> First thing, are, are they confident? Simple enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guys, any more questions? Yeah, I mean, I can keep going. I'm <laughs> um, just talking about just, uh, you know, guest stars and, and directors that came in and out of the office. Was there any favorable directors that that you looked upon that stood out to you as in any cameos that kind of stood out to you? Well, you know, here's the thing. In season two, Carol Burnett at the Emmy Awards, she says, I want to be on The Office. And Greg Daniels says, oh, no way. She's way too famous. We can't have her on the show. And I'm like, yeah, we can. Let's have her as Bob Vance's receptionist <laughs> or his mother. <laughs> you know, I think Carol Burnett, sure. Sure. So, you know, because he says, well, that'll throw the realism of the show off, right? Well, get to season six, season seven, season eight, season nine. <laughs> it's just a who's who. I mean, yeah, everybody, everybody in the world was in there, you know. Um, I didn't mind the cameos. I mean, you know, but at that point, we we're uh, a big hit, you know, so obviously the dynamic changes, you know. Um, for instance, when Phyllis's wedding, uh, when that aired on broadcast, Greg Daniels had a party at his house for the screen. We screened it live. Well, standing on the on the front porch with Phyllis and who walks up but Harold Ramis. <laughs> well, I'm a mean, huge Harold Ramis fan. I mean, who is that? I mean, he's one of, the, <laughs> one of the great comedy guys. So he's like, Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. I'm like, that's my line. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, he comes in, he watches the show with us. So I'm watching him watch the show, you know. So when Bob says, ah, if you ever lay a finger on Phyllis, I'll kill you. Uh, <laughs> I killed him with that. And that was the, the best moment for me was, you know, I'm killing Harold Ramis here. So I know I'm doing something right. That's awesome. Wow. I'm sure that's that's something the great to have in your pocket, right? Yeah. Wow. Well, the thing about the guest directors is is that they're not really rocking the boat. You know, I mean, the the cast is already so established and everything is pretty well figured out. It's all lit, but you know, they don't have to. There's really not a lot of directing for them to do. Uh, <laughs> so they, you know, they were honorary. <laughs> They were in there a week, you know, and they did two weeks. Usually they would come in and scout for a week and then, you know, watch us work and then, then they'd shoot it. But, they, you know, there wasn't a lot of directing going on. Um, so back to Psycho Cop. <laughs> I'm just curious. Do you, do you ever imagine um, any, like, crossovers maybe with, like, Michael Myers or, like, Jason Voorhees? Oh, you know, it's funny uh, that you mentioned that because – we had a screening of it in February in Hollywood, a packed theater, okay. all industry people. And uh, William Lustig was there, the director of Maniac Cop. Right, now, right. I've never seen Maniac Cop. I have no interest in Maniac Cop. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm aware of it, obviously, the title. And, you know, I've worked with uh, Robert Dobby, who was in number three of that scene. Right. So Bill Lustig is there, and Adam Rifkin introduces me to him. And, uh, I said, you know, that's funny that you're here, William, because for the last 25 years, people have been asking me, who would win in a fight, Maniac <laughs> Cop or Psycho Cop? <laughs> yeah. And he looks at me and he goes, well, and I go, you're looking at him. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I totally agree. I, I, and I think the Psycho Cops are much better than the Maniac Cops, in my opinion. Well, it appealed to me because I didn't have to wear uh, facial makeup in it. I got to be myself and tell jokes and, you know... Yeah bring my own sense of humor to it. I mean, all I was doing was trying to be like Vincent Price and Christopher Lee. Mm -hmm. I mean, those guys have uh, what I call malevolent glee. I mean, they reveled in their, in their madness and their killing and their insanity. So that's, you know, if a character's named Psycho <laughs> Cop, right. you know, you have to embrace that. Right. <laughs> uh, guys, any final questions? 
Um, what would you look back at your character then, and how do you see yourself now? What do you mean? A psycho cop? Um, Bob for Bob Vance, like, um, going in, watching your episodes, how did it feel that it impacted your life? Oh, well, it, it was a huge impact. I mean, uh, because the show uh, was loved by my peers. Everybody in, in Hollywood respected the show. So from that point on, every time I went to a set, you know, it was always, oh, we got Bob Vance from The Office this year. You know, it was a big deal. But it also meant that I had to bring more game. I could never, you know, not that I ever took it easy, but, you know, I, I had to deliver. <laughs> it actually increased the pressure on me, you know, to be to be good. So not that I needed extra pr pressure, but um, it, it was definitely a life changer. I mean, that was the, the only – that's the thing that you always look for in, in the acting game is, is this going to change my life or is this just another gig, right? Am, am I doing a guest star on the show? Is this going to change my life? Probably not. Um, so the office was definitely a life changer. I mean, I'm talking to you about it right now, 15 years later. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and there you and I'm not tired of it yet. I, I'm still, I've been saying Bob Vance, Vance refrigeration for 15 years. I'm not tired of it. <laughs> I don't think I will get tired of it. So uh, if you need a cameo for your uh, friend's birthday or anniversary, <laughs> you know where to find me. That's a good plug. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Listen, cameo, uh, there was a Couch Guy Sports just did a review of cameo.com. Who was the best value? Who was the worst value of the athletes, right? And they named four non-notable athletes of note. That would be the Soup Nazi, <laughs> the voice from Grand Theft Auto, uh, to Catch a Predator and Bob Vance. Vance Perfect. Perfect. So that's good company right there. You know. That's great. That's great. And great. That's, that, to, to, to say, hey, like you're kind of that, uh, you're iconic just as the soup Nazi was to Seinfeld. I'm sure that is just, you know, incredibly feel, it's an incredible feeling for you to know that you're in that echelon of like well, characters. I still don't really believe it. You know, people write hashtag legend all the time. <laughs> sure, what, what legend? You know, I'm still surprised when people know who I am. I'm like, how do they know who I am? Uh, you know, but, I mean, it's just, a, yeah. I was never interested in being famous. You know, I was interested in being a great actor. Yeah. And that was the difference, right? Um, most young people today want to be famous. I don't know why, uh, but... I think it has to do something with being loved or something. I don't know. I, I don't really want to get into the psychoanalysis of that. <laughs> but my goal was never to be famous. And so uh, to find it, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a, a fun little thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And if I may say, I do think it's really wonderful that a show like The Office has, has made stars out of uh, characters that don't really get as much like three-dimensional representation i think um like people that are living very ordinary lives that most most people in america are living um that it's like that they have their jobs they might have a few friends and you know they might go out to the bar on friday night after work but um the fact that it's like the, that's that's not shown as simple that's not shown as um like two-dimensional it's just it's really wonderful to see that and i think that that also speaks to you as an actor that well you're it, it, listen for all those people you know that's where i come from i mean as long as you have love in your life then you have a rich full life regardless of money or fame or what your occupation is right if you're loved and you love then you're in business so that's really uh that's really the key thing Nice. And with that, I think we're going to have to wrap things up. That's a lovely way to good end. right there. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, as good as it gets right there. Um, All right. So, Robert, I want to thank you so much for your time tonight. This was amazing. It was great to yes, meet you. Yes, thank you. Yes. And let me just put, I, I, I am, since you're here, I wanted to say it like Michael Scott did. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Vance. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I'm Kid Champagne me. Matthew Haberman. Check me out for my podcast, Nostalgia Time with Kid Champagne. Our next right. episode is going to be a tribute to The Office. All right. Terrific. 
Rachel, Chris, Matt, thank you. And of course, Robert, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And yes, thank looking you. forward thank to cycle so three. <laughs> oh, yeah. Awesome. You have the right to remain dead. <laughs> Perfect, guys. Well, thanks, everyone watching at home. Right. Vices, uh, we'll see you next time. Okay, take care. Thanks, Robert. Take care. Take care. Take care.